clarity. And it deals with the dynamics of what we call self-organizing criticality from the zero point to infinity. And we'll talk about what that means. The idea of the Y bias concept is that it's a model. Look, the model that we deal with now, the standard model, standard physical model, is an agglomeration of all kinds of information derived from all kinds of very carefully siloed kinds of experimental verification. It's been cobbled together without having any underlying cogency. Anybody disagree with that? Not yet. Nope. <laughs> And so what we have then, by definition, by default, is a model which not only is not complete in its description of how nature works, but has some fundamental failings. It's, again, like Stephen Greer said at the very beginning, it's like the ten guys trying to, with blindfolds trying to describe the elephant. We're really trying to pierce the mysteries. We run up hard against them. The finer we granulate our investigation, the bigger the mysteries become. So now we're at that point. We've graduated from Cartesian physics to Newtonian physics to quantum physics. And now we have a whole new kind of physics. Because the physics we deal with today operates in such a way that the most powerful microscopes, the largest, most powerful telescopes, all take us to a place where there's no fundamental distinction between the physical stuff and the spirit stuff. You cannot, in any meaningful way, distinguish the observer from the means of observation or that which is being observed. This is now the subject of very hard, impeccable, repeatedly verified experimental evidence, which has been rigorously reported. It's not included in the standard model yet. It's only been 30 years since they found this out. But it's impeccable nevertheless. That information is impeccable. So what we're trying to do with our model here is to say, look, it doesn't have to be that way. When you try to create a model that says, how does nature work? You've got to begin either all the way at the top or all the way inside at the bottom. And if you use the same reductionist strategy that Western science has always used, assuming that the universe really is a clockwork mechanism, and if you break it down into the smallest constituent parts, at some point you know where all the pieces look like. So if you know what the pieces look like, and you can't get them any smaller, and you know how they fit together, then you know something important about how nature works. Well, that'd be fine. If it weren't for the fact that when you get down to a certain scale, you can't distinguish between the physical stuff and the consciousness stuff. And what you want in your conscious choices affects what you view in your detachment as an observer. So you just can't get there from here. And not only at the finest scales, but of John Archibald Wheeler's mind experiments with far distant photons is any indicator you can't get there at the macro scale either. So we decided that we kind of slice this from a different point of view, from a different place. What do we know about nature that's universal? What do we know about it that's consistent, that operates at all scales with uniformity and consistency? Let's forget about the distinctions. Let's forget about the special cases and considerations. Let's forget about the special exceptions. What operates at every scale from the top to the bottom in the cosmos? What do we know? Well, it's a very interesting list. In the slide presentation, if you look at it, we talk about the standard model. The standard model is predicated on a notion called the Big Bang. And from our point of view, after you see how our model's been reconstructed, it becomes pretty clear that the Big Bang is simply not a supportable argument. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, and rather than go through all of this long list of things that the standard model doesn't do, because we're short on time, I'll let you just go through the monograph and let you go through the slide presentation when you get your copy and you can kind of consider that on your own. We know the standard model's broken. 
we know basically what's wrong with it. We don't need to spend a lot of time fooling with that. Okay. There's reason for hope in terms of what's been going on in science. It's true that Maxwell's quaternions are not found in any of their subsets in any model of electrodynamic engineering anywhere on the planet. None of the original equations or the derivatives are found in the textbooks anywhere. The corollary is also true. None of the formulas that are being taught anywhere were ever part of Maxwell's formulation. Well, a bunch of guys got together in 1994, and by 1999, Tom Bearden, Myron Evans, Larry Crowell, Donnie Reed, guys we all know who have been very active in the new energy movement, who have done a lot of really great work, and people from all over the world, 18 of them all together, published a scientific monograph, 60 reports, that is a reformulation of Maxwell's electrodynamic equations. And in this monograph, they correct all 22 of the fundamental errors that were introduced into the quaternions by the imposition of the Lorenz transform. So if it makes a difference to you in terms of what those formulas mean and what they say, this information is now available. How many people on the planet even know that? Except for the people in this room yeah. and people who used, to, who used to subscribe to the Journal of New Energy, nobody. But that information is fabulous and it needs to be in the world. It needs to be reincorporated, and it's available. Yes. And I just—is it your view that that's really, though, not been vetted or taken seriously by mainstream? I don't think mainstream science has even even, even seen aware it. Of it probably, right? They haven't even seen it. You're probably correct. Look, Larry Crowell and Myron Evans are as mainstream as you get. In other in their other domains. <laughs> no, I mean, these guys are just as good as it comes. They're just as good as it comes. And Don, as a mathematician, Don Reed is as good as there is now. So my notion about that is that there's a reason it hasn't been incorporated into the, into the lexicon of information. It's because there's a fundamental institutional resistance to solving the problem. All right? Another thing has happened. We all know the wild man, Ruggiero Santilli. Wonderful guy. When he's on lithium, he's the greatest guy on the planet. <laughs> when he's wearing his red like a, like a bicycle suit, stay out of his way. He's in 15th gear. Right? But Ruggiero... He's a full professor at MIT. He did battle with Murray Gell-Mann over Gell-Mann's discovery of the quark and his award of the Nobel Prize. Ruggiero made a very public pronouncement that quarks are not subject to gravitational force and therefore are not matter and therefore are not indivisible. They violate the Pauli exclusion principle and therefore they're not a real thing. And they had this big battle and of course Ruggiero lost. And after that, he did a wonderful piece of work. You know, he spent twice nominated for the Nobel, once in math and once in physics. And that's a matter of record. Twice nominated. So even though he's never gotten it, you've got to admit it says something about his intellect. He wrote a book that is a reformulation of hadronic mechanics. The title of the book is El, El Grande Grido. A cry in the wilderness. And it's a fabulous piece of work. And it says things about the way atoms work, about the atomic model is fundamentally insuperable. He's just right on the money. Nobody knows it's there. Never heard of it before. 